Hello. Until everyone comes on. Um, okay, so Yankee's here. So I'm gonna add And hopefully it worked. All right. That was, hey, that was hey. pretty cool. Painless. <laughs> Simple. Um, how are you? I'm doing well. Do you do you hear me well? I do. Perfect. Okay. Um, so let's do a little intro as people are joining about you and your background. I mean, I can say um I've heard Yankee speak um a few times and i've been blown away and i've been fortunate that he was actually um a mentor to my children and and um was was you know pivotal in their uh basic education of really important topics that most people don't um talk about in in orthodox communities um, but because of that, I feel like my kids have a very solid, um, foundation and I'm very grateful personally. Well, th their mother's not that bad either. So. <laughs> Thanks. But I just thought I would put that out there because it's really, really important. Um, because uh, like, I, I, I'm just very impressed at the sensitivity and the, you know, and the way in which you approach very sensitive topics and, so we're honored to have you um, talk about okay. another sensitive topic. I, lo I love it. So it's great. Um, so I'll tell you, first of all, before I tell you a little bit about me, I do want to commend you for all that you're doing. Um, I've actually been one of the people tuning in to watch these lives over the last few weeks and uh, really, enjoyed, um, really enjoyed them all. So um, keep it up and keep at it. And I know that we scheduled this a long time ago. So the fact mm -hmm. that there's such a demand to, um, to do this is a credit to the work that you do with Pro Project Proactive and um, helping destigmatize the world of mental health because we need that more now, now more than ever. So all the credit to you. Thank you. Um, so I... I have uh, had a little bit of a, a journey to where I am now. I started off my professional career working in New York um, at the Yatskan Center, which was a residential um, drug and alcohol rehab center. I worked under Louis Abrams. I actually worked with Alexander Rand. We were counselors there oh. at the same time. He was, he was on here a few weeks ago. I know. Unfortunately, um, it didn't save, and I'm really upset about it. Uh, it was but good. He, he did a good job, though. Hopefully, I'll get him to record what he said because it was really good. It was, yeah, it was very nice. So, um, so we we were actually counselors there at the same time, um, and then I, I moved out to LA to start an alternative high school program and create a, a drop-in center out in LA with an organization called H Tumid, um, and uh, they're still doing a fantastic job out over there. Um, and then three years after that, I. Um, got an opportunity to move to Chicago and um, help establish Madrigos Midwest over here in Chicago. And I served as the clinical director for 10 years um, and you know, really proud of the work that uh, the organization did and continues to do. Um, they, they are really doing some fantastic work and really reaching a lot of, uh, a lot of kids in very creative ways. And I think it speaks a lot about the community here in Chicago as well to really engage in that. Um, recently, I uh, went off into the private practice world and uh, been doing that for the last few months, uh, full-time private practice, um, focusing my work on trauma and addiction, um, both drugs and alcohol and sex addiction. Okay. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, okay, so should we get into the topic? <laughs> now or never. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So I guess, I mean, should I, I guess I'll just jump into it. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you have any specific questions that you want to ask. So I'm wondering if you could explain what moral incongruence, like what the topic moral incongruence and how it relates to mm-hmm. uh, sexual um, addictions. Okay. Like, yeah. because I'm not sure if, if everybody really understands what that means. Um, um so it's important yeah it, 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 it <laughs> is it, it's it's very important and i think and i think it's a, it, i think it's something that is going to be getting a lot more um attention you know probably um in the next few years only because of how insane the world of internet pornography is um and so i think there's there's going to get some attention so first of all i think the way to understand moral incongruence is the first step really is to understand what sex addiction is, right? Because then we can like scale it back and talk about what moral incongruence is. So um, sex addiction really is a repetitive compulsion to act out sexually, um, where someone who's under stress will seek out this compulsive behavior to soothe themselves. And, um, And there really is there really is a, a, a real de- a way to define and structure and understand sex addiction. Um, but what's happened is over, over these last number of years with the, with the infusion of internet pornography and the, the, that, I mean, and taking this, taking it a little bit further back, you know, when the industry started, um, however many year, uh, however many years ago, um, you know, it, it, it got it got a little confusing because the 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 classical sex ther- sex addict the classical sex addict was able to be really defined by um, through studies that was that were done by ITAP and, and really kind of understand like where they're coming from and for the most part, um, you know, the the classical sex addict was. Um, someone who came from an authoritative, very rigid family structure where there was you know, my way or the highway, um, where emotions were viewed as, as being weak. So if you shared any type of emotion, you were a weak person. Um, where there was, there was abuse and early trauma there, whether it was uh, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, but there was definitely an abuse um, component to that. Um, and, um, and I think... Uh, like, like I was saying before, the rigid, but also a disengaged family, right? So, so that, that was, you know, that was like, that was a recipe for disaster for a lot of classical sex addicts, the people who, who would have multiple affairs, who would, you know, be, um, you know, voyeurs or, you know, uh, people exposing themselves out, you know, with the, you know, with that image of the person walking around naked with the long trench coat and, you know, flashing him himself or herself, um, you know, hiring prostitutes, going to strip clubs, all that stuff. But what's happened, what's happened in the world of pornography is that people who didn't necessarily come from those backgrounds, who came from a very loving, supportive background, they, um, they, you know, they would fall into the, you know, pun, I guess, intended, they'd fall into this web of, of um, of pornography and masturbation and all of those things that kind of you know really um, if you were in a if you were in a, a marriage and if you were in a relationship it, you know it, it felt very deceiving um, but you didn't necessarily come from that type of family background you didn't necessarily suffer from abuse so the contemporary sex addict is someone who is literally just you know um, through through this repetitive compulsion has kind of conditioned themselves to um, calm themselves that way while they're under stress. So it's not necessarily so it's familial. Like, like an eating disorder would be. Yeah, it's very similar. Actually, what was interesting, and I think we spoke about this on, on one of our phone calls, the, the part of the brain that controls eating, sex, and gambling is separate from the part of the brain that controls drugs and alcohol, you know, the, the need to escape uh, through drugs and alcohol. So there, there is a connection between eating and and sex, both things you can't really be abstinent from. It's not part of the human function to be abstinent from it. Um, can't not eat. And most people like to engage in sex. 
So yeah. it's it's um it, it it's something that's um you know that's really taken a whole new understanding. So when you look at moral congruence, which I guess is really the focus of of tonight, it's it's something that you're not necessarily that that, that term I used before the the repeti- the repetition compulsion. Right, where you're not necessarily going back over and over again to soothe yourself, to calm yourself, but uh, let's talk about the Jewish community, right? The, the religious community. It's a sin to masturbate, right? There, it it is. I was um, looking up some 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 essays, and it's also in there. There was a bunch of essays about the Catholic community, also. Yes. It's 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 any faith based communities. Yes has the similar issue. So yes, I feel yes. like it's, it's global. It, it, it is. It, it's very global. And, and, and I, I've, I've met, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed and privileged to be able to work with and support people from, from all faiths. And, and, you know, whether you're Lutheran, Protestant, um, Catholic, um, th- there's, there, is, there is this line of thinking where, you know, where you, there are certain behaviors that are just not acceptable. It's sinful behavior. Um, and in, in Judaism as well, um, that it, it is a sin to, to, to masturbate. Um, that being said, you're not a sex addict if you masturbate, right? If someone, um, it, it's part of normal human development that there's going to be exploration. There's going to be curiosity. Um, there, there's, there, it's going to happen on purpose and it's going to happen by accident, right? And, you know, just because you masturbate um, doesn't mean that you're a sex addict. And I think what happens is in, in a very taboo world, um, whether, you know, faith-based, you know, really strong faith-based communities where it's, it's very taboo, People will go to their rabbi. People will go to their 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 pastor, their priest, whoever it may be, and go in with a boatload of shame and say, "Hey, you know what? I I have a sex addiction. I I've masturbated, um, and I've done it uh, a couple times, and I feel terribly guilty about it." And um and the uneducated rabbi or the uneducated I'm sorry I don't know if that, I don't know if that's going to be back that's coming in. Um, the uneducated, not okay, the uneducated, by the uneducated pastor is going to, you know, you know, try to tackle this and say, well, you know, you must have a sex addict and you got to go to treatment. You got to go into therapy. You got to go into SA, SAA. You got to really um, deal with this um, on a, on a, you know, clinical level. And, you know, it's always good to listen. I'm a, I'm a proponent of therapy, you know, go to therapy just because it's great. And it's helpful, um, but you're not a sex addict, and you don't have any issues if you go against your moral. Um, what, what what is your 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 moral beliefs and your value based? Right, we are going to make mistakes, whether it's with whether it's with this issue, or whether it's with um, you know gossiping, slandering, um, you know taking something um, when you shouldn't be taking it, whether it's um, you know, you get a little bit of extra change at the supermarket and, you know, you don't realize it till later and then you don't necessarily run back to give it back, you know, or you get the free, whatever it may be, right? You're not a kleptomaniac if you take, you know, if you didn't get charged that thing. And and just like you're not a kleptomaniac for, for getting that, you know, free item, you're not necessarily a sex addict if you've masturbated, if you looked at pornography. It, um that industry, and I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about how crazy that industry is. Um, but moral incongruence is is falling into these behaviors that go against your moral, your morals, and your values. And you know whether it's a sin, not, you know, however you want to look at it, but it's not doesn't necessarily define you as a sex addict. And I think one of the issues that we have, certainly in in the Orthodox community, and I, and and I'm I'm sure this is true with with um with the other faith based communities is we're not really sure how to talk about this directly with kids at the right age. 
And I think that's one of our biggest missions now, especially because with how profound um, pornography is, right? It's only a matter of time until a kid finds it, until a kid stumbles upon it, or it goes and actually seeks it out. And if um, and we need to be able to have these open conversations and um, talk about these things in a very real way. You know, I, 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 I want to say something, and b- before I say anything that's religious, I'm not a rabbi. For everyone out there, I'm not a rabbi. So if I'm going to say something that's a little bit rabbinic, I, I like to consult with the rabbi before I say it. So I spoke with the, I spoke with the rabbi earlier, and I, 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 I shared this idea, and he, he, he liked it. So, um, and then he actually told me that he thinks that uh, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky actually said what, what I'm about to share. The, the, um, the, um, the Torah tells us that when um, Yaakov, Jacob, conceived Reuben, um, the commentaries there, um, Rashi, point out that it was the first time that Yaakov spilled his seed. It was in the conceiving of Reuben. Um, and the, and the, the reason that it points it out is because it's, it's kind of not normal, <laughs> if you can. It's not normal that Yaakov, at his age, the first time he actually spilled his seed was when he conceived Reuben. So, you know, the fact that there are going to be, you know, almost every single teenager out there, every single person is going to, you know, ejaculate and masturbate, and, you know, whether it's on purpose or, or you know, whether it's a wet dream or, or anything like that, it's going to be, it, it, it's going to happen. And for us to, to expect perfection with that and, and, and to expect everyone to be, you know, the forefather Yaakov is, is a little bit, um, is, is unfair. But the and I think we, is we, full of, it, it of, is. of mistakes. And I, funny, and I remember when I looked from challenges and, yeah. um, I mean, that's what's the beauty of, that's why it's so beautiful to, to read it because it's not, it, it's actually very human when, I mean, I, so I get into arguments with people a lot about this because, um, because certain people, like certain people say you can't say that, you know, that, that, that you can't, you can, that you can relate, but really, I mean, it, it depends on who you speak to, but anyways, right. I just, I find it so fabulous that like, right. we're not it's not a religion of perfection. It's a religion right. of rising from failure and from challenges. And, 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 and also the message that God knows what the human challenge is. Like he, he understands that we are just humans. We're not angels. We're not perfect. We're going to mess up. And part of living life is picking yourself back up and trying to continue to grow. And you know, with with Joseph and his and that that whole, he was called Joseph the the, the righteous, because he withstood the temptation of of uh, Asia's Potiphar, right? And, you know, and there you could say well, that that that's easier for you know you know you shouldn't be with a woman that you shouldn't be with, then don't do it. But if the Torah is pointing that out, that that was a real challenge, and he he right. about the fact that that it calls him the righteous. So the, these are these are real these are real issues and real topics that as we talk to our kids in this very sexualized world, we need to be able to change the way we speak about it. And, and I was speaking with this rabbi, actually, I remember, I, I forgot what grade I was in, but I was told when I was a kid, I forgot how, how, how old I was, that the punishment for masturbation is you get to hell and elephants will trample all over you. Elephants? Elephants, right? That's what I was told. That does and not so sound that, like right. I mean, listen, right? I, I'm not sure how many how many people it stopped from from that behavior after hearing that, but it just it added to the guilt and the shame to that. He told me this rabbi told me that his rabbi told him this is going back you know a number of years, and I'm hoping today's generation of rabbis don't share these corrupt ways of understanding it, if I, if I can be so bold. Um, he said that your semen is boiled up and you're dropped in it and burnt up in your semen in hell. You know, I, 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 I don't know the source of that. And, and, if, and if there is a source for something like that, I also believe 
that we have a very loving, um, compassionate God who understands what it means to grow up in 2020 in, a, in, in an extremely sex, sexualized world. You know, you can be 20 degrees here in Chicago and people are still walking around as if it's, you know, 90 degrees in Miami Beach. So that's the world we live in. That's, that's that's a very important yes and and you know what and for every for every uh yosef in the torah like when you read navi you see a lot of stories where they weren't successful right and, and where we have i mean we we see like i, I actually um we were doing nafiomi as a family and i had to stop because um, after I read, uh, after we finished show team, I was like, I, ca I can't do this anymore. I have to take a break mm -hmm. because it was just so, it was so disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel, I feel like the Torah is so real and, and Hashem puts things out there like that. And, right. and yeah, so there's Yosef is a success, but there's a lot of, Right. Not only not only is he, is he a success, he's called the righteous because of of what it took for him to do that. And, he was an anom anomaly. He was an anomaly. He, he was he was extremely unique. The fact that he was able to withstand that type of temptation, and I think that when we talk to our kids, and and we can discuss, uh, you know, at what age should we start talking to, you know, our kids? First of all, as parents, but even in the education system. What age we should be? Um, what age we should start talking to our kids about um, these temptations and and sexual development and and you know not just not just about that but about um, you know what what do you do with your temptations? What happens if you mess up? What happens if you do have a wet dream? What happens if you do masturbate? Do you you know go into this whole guilt shame cycle and and you know wait for the elephants to trample on you? Or, or do you just say, hey, that's life, you know, it's time to pick yourself up and, uh, and, and go forward. And I think that's the narrative that we need to, that we need to start addressing. And, and I, I do believe that there's a lot of movement in that direction. Mm -hmm. but, um, but definitely um, the, the, the moral incongruence piece of it, and this is kind of ties into where I think we're going to go, is talking about the shame, mm -hmm. is the level of shame that people have when they when they find themselves again whether purposefully or by accident um doing things that go against their morals and values it's not a definition you're not being defined as a sex addict you messed up you know mm -hmm. and maybe if if it was even done on purpose like you you have to look at it differently and and i think um one of the ways that we could do that is really understanding what our challenges are and 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 being human, like like what you were saying before, being human about what these challenges are. Um, you know, um, I don't know if you, you you know some of the Chicago people. Jerry Loeb, who is one of my my mentors, he 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 told me that, um, and he said this publicly, I think once, is I believe from Rabbi Volby, um, that by the time teenage boys learn that masturbation is forbidden they're already addicted that, that, that that's revolve you talking how many years ago right um so you know we, first of all, i think we have to educate our kids younger we have to mm -hmm. educate and we have to educate our kids before they start in my opinion before they start um you know obviously at, on an age appropriate level before they start um you know going through puberty, going through some of these changes, conditioning themselves to not look at things that they shouldn't be looking at. Um, but also giving them the message that, you know, the two things, and Alicia have a list talk about this uh, mm -hmm. when she was on, on your live, about how amazing Hashem is that he made this, this behavior and this interaction, this genuine intimacy, and that's really what, what sex is. It's genuine intimacy between a husband and a wife where Hashem made that such a beautiful and pleasurable, it's okay to say that, right? Mm -hmm. Experience that you get to experience with your spouse. 
And once people, um, you know, once we once we're able to name that and talk about it, it 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 becomes less, you know, less guilt driven, mm -hmm. less shame driven, and and we could really, you know, have. First of all, it, it'll make kids want to talk about talk about it more, which you know, as a parent and as an edu as educators, information is power. Oh. So we really we really want to open up the conversation, and if we make it bad, we make it evil, we make it, you know, first of all, it, you know, all the issues that come up with 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 husbands with brides and grooms, um, you know, uh, the night of their wedding because they're not, you know, they're not allowed to, you know. Either they're not allowed, or they don't really even know what to do. But that, I think that's a small segment of the or community. Or the, sen the sensations feel <laughs> dirty to them. Like I've heard that yeah, a lot. Right, like right. The, the sensations that really should feel good actually feel dirty because they've been conditioned to. Right. To 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 identify that with with with, you know. With shame. With, with shame and 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 punishment and um. But again, I, I think that, that that element is really a, a small segment of, of of the global community. But I, but definitely, um, you know, we we have to remove. It's not stigma. It's really remove the shame and really you know celebrate it in obviously age appropriate, but celebrate what it can be, and the fact and normalize the struggle. Normalize you know obviously you know men and Boys and girls are, are different. Their sensations and their temptations are are different. But you know, one of the lines that I've told, um, I've 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 told, um, you know, my children, and I've told, um, you know, other kids, welcome to the club. This is what it means to be a religious man. This is this is the struggle, mm -hmm. right? And and there will be times that you succeed and there are going to be times when you screw up you know celebrate when you succeed and sell and and you know just brush yourself off when you don't now i was working and i, I want to share this with you i i was working with a boy once who was who was 16 years old so it's hard to call him a sex addict but his his talk about repetition compulsion it was certainly there he was he was masturbating um over 10 times a day really yeah yeah he, re really to a point and when we spoke about like you know first of all the, the 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 desire to stop or the desire to kind of try to get it under control he he just looked at me he said what's the point i have no more soul so i was like what do you mean you have no more soul he said well every time i sin in this way a piece of my soul goes away and i've done it so many times already that i have no more soul so I asked him, where, where did you get this from? He goes, it's written in the books. <laughs> it's, it's written in the books. I said, which one? He, I, he obviously couldn't come up with it. Oh, gosh. So, so I asked him, I said, which rabbi do you want to ask whether you still have a soul? And he, he you know, he's like, oh, I'm not going to ask anyone. I said, no, I know you're not going to. I'll, I'll ask. Which rabbi do you, wanna, do you want to um, to ask. And finally, we, we came up with, uh, you know, he, he, he chose the rabbi, which was, I'll, I'll say it here because I heard it from this rabbi. It was Rav David Zucker, who's the Rosh Kolel of the Chicago Community Kolel. So I went to Rabbi Zucker and I said, um, I, have, I have this question from this boy. Um, one question is, he says that he doesn't have a soul because he's masturbated so many times. Is that true? And two, um, what do you want to tell this boy? So he said, it's absolutely not true that a piece of your soul goes away. He said, yeah, it's a blemish on your soul. Every time you do a sin, it's a blemish on your soul. But, you know, we got, we got to, you know, we're, we're not perfect beings, but we got to go. And yes, this is a, you know, this is a, a, a big sin, you know, you know, so to speak, a big sin. Um, so we, we have to try not to do it, but it, it doesn't take away, doesn't take away your soul. And then he told me to tell the boy, and this this actually blew my mind, and I and I've shared this a lot um, since since he told this to me a few years ago. He said there's a connection between um, slander and gossiping, which in in Hebrew is called uh, lashon hara, and with 
with masturbation, which in Hebrew is called Shmir Sabris, right? So there's a connection between the two of them. And with regard to uh, slandering and gossip, which is also a pretty bad, you know, sin to do, um, every time a person wants to talk about somebody else or slander them or you know, just, you know, share some nice juicy information and he holds himself back or she holds himself back, it, it, um, it's metak in the neshama. It, it, it repairs the the soul twice. It like says double, tell time. The, du- double time, right? So tell tell this boy that every time he doesn't, every, he says the same is true with with uh, with masturbation. Every time you don't masturbate, you repair your soul twice. So you may have a blemish, but every time you don't do it, it you repair your soul twice. That's and that's coming. Really, that's really yeah, nice. and that's coming from the Rosh Kolel, you know. <laughs> so I, I just like, I know that in in secular society today, so it's all like a lot of of kind of celebrating masturbation and celebrating all of you know things that are not necessarily. Uh, in congruence with the uh, with Torah values, um, right. but I really be. like the way that you don't you don't have to give up the values that you hold dear. Like when you can understand it like this, there doesn't need to be that incongruence. Right. We, we, are you talking about? By celebrating, we don't, just, need, we we don't need, need. There's a the difference discussion. between celebrating, um, celebrating, doing whatever you want, right, and accepting that we're human. There's right. like a very big difference, and I think that that's kind of a lot of people who are, are turned off of religion. I feel like like they're turned off because 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 of that shame and because of the the incongruence but but if you just recognize all of these challenges as 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 something that's human and and natural then there doesn't need to be that shame that's pushing you to 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 Mm -hmm. celebrate values that are completely the opposite of what you've believed your whole life Mm -hmm. And remember, if, if, and, and if you look at it from, from the perspective that shame is just an element of, of feeling despair, right? That shame-guilt cycle that people, you know, and, and on some level we all do this. We trap ourselves in this shame-guilt cy- shame cycle. It's really an element of, of a sense of despair. So if you look at it from, like an, from, from an addictive um, model, right, you have your you – have your, your, your core belief that's not really based in reality. It's just a, a way that we think that makes us miserable. We, we kind of scoop into or transition into this impaired memory, this impaired thinking, right? Whether we rationalize or minimize or, um, you know, take things very black and white. Um, and then what happens is with, with either sex addiction or even with, with you know, porn and masturbation addiction, this is, this is true, we kind of slip into this addictive cycle where, where we start to um, preoccupy our mind with how you know how how are we going to relieve ourselves from this this hell that we that we're that we're experiencing up over here, um, and then we get into this this sense of you know that's kind of like where the urge and the cravings that's where that kicks in, and then we kind of slip into this ritualization the the behaviors that we do whether whether we you know, whether we start looking online for, you know, prostitutes for, you know, the, the contemporary sex at, for, for the classical sex addicts, or whether we start like Googling images first, you know, um, for the more uh, contemporary sex addict. Um, and, and then the, the acting out behavior begins and we feel, um, we feel, despair afterwards right because oh, why, why do i do this why do i kind of get caught up in that and that's where the guilt guilt and shame kind of kicks in so what do we do when we feel terrible about ourselves we start thinking about how am i going to call myself back down to okay i'm going to start looking at images back down to this okay, really sounds like dieting 
<laughs> it's the same brain. It's the same it's brain. The same brain. <laughs> it's the same brain. Um. Yes. That that's no, like seriously, you could literally replace like pornography addiction with food addiction. Right. Yeah, and then the same way for for any gambling addict that's watching this, they can tell you it's gonna be the same that same feeling also, and and that addictive cycle is is is, is true with drugs and alcohol also. You know that the way that plays out, it, it you know it's gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna feel the same way, but you know it's, it's, it's a different part of the brain. So, if there's a way to raise, I guess the moral incongruence doesn't really fit with with that as much. Well, that, no, that you're just... raised in a shame based environment where you know, ice cream is bad, then all you want is ice cream. Right. No, so all you want is ice cream, but maybe not because you know it's bad. But, you know, haagen is pretty good. So if I have it, then I feel like I, I just did the worst thing in the world. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't have, let's say, you, you, like we, we've established this in the, in the beginning of this, of this uh, conversation. You know, masturbation in in many faith based communities is forbidden. It's a sin, right? So, you know, I, um, there was somebody, and I, um, I forgot who told me this, but some a colleague of mine told me this. That he was working with someone who came in with with a masturbation addiction, and then at some point he started to like realize something was off. He asked him, "How how often are you masturbating?" He said once, about once every six months, right? So the guy's like, you know, it, it's. I I hear that you feel very guilty about that, and and I, you know that's, you know that's uh it's a shame that you feel guilty about that. It's a shame that you feel guilty about that. Um, but that that's not sex addiction. That's just feeling like you're doing the wrong thing, right? So we so he ended up helping him out of you know that that shame. And and I think that most most sensitive therapists, most sensitive people that you talk to who understand this field, aren't going to go out and promote, you know, you know, you know, full blown masturbation. Um, but um, but it's something that um, it, it happens, and and we shouldn't feel like we shouldn't feel suffocated by a human condition, right? Mm -hmm. We have enough, we have enough anxiety, right? We have enough anxiety, we have enough depression, we have enough um, challenges, right? We, we don't need this to be something that crushes us any more than it does because we all want to be good people. We want to be God-fearing, God-loving people, doing the right thing, you know, um, keeping as many mitzvot as possible, but there are going to be times where we mess up and that shouldn't crush us. That shouldn't be meant to destroy us. That's why the Torah tells us, so I said before, why Joseph is called the righteous. So why the Torah makes a point, and really in the, in the commentary, Rashi um, makes a point to say that the first drop of semen that, that Jacob released was in the conceiving of Ruvay. So, um, so I, I think I think we have to change the way we talk about this, and I, I don't support elephants trampling you as a mode of uh, <laughs> as a as a mode to, to talk about that. But really, just you know, un, you know, talk about it as in, in, in as real of a way as we can. And you know, I think that's that's the way that we need to shift. And um, so what age would you recommend starting to talk? So, like I said, my, my, my mentor, Jerry Loeb, um, his, his, his approach to this, and I'll, I, I, I use his approach when I talk about this, and I'm giving him credit um, here. Um, the, the, the discussion about sex and sexual behavior um, uh, really should start pre-puberty and and talking about 
and, and talking about the idea that there's going to be a time right now to look at, to look at things that you shouldn't look at, right? Most, in the Orthodox community, most kids can understand the term not sneeze, right? So you can talk to your kids about not sneeze. Um, and, you know, so you look at that because there, there is going to be a time where, you, where you're going to want to look, right? So let's try to condition ourselves now that when we see something not sneeze, we don't look. Um, and it's really kind of just before the, before the iron gets hot, trying to, trying to do that. Um, and then I think, I think the next, the next phase is, and again, with every age, and this is a whole other discussion you know, about how to right. really go into this. But as the kid gets older, you talk more and more until, the, until you actually are having a full blown, you know, conversation. If you don't feel comfortable saying the word masturbation, you know, you could say Zara Lavatala or spilling your seed. There are so many ways to, you know, to talk about the actual act of masturbation that you have to say that. Um, but yeah, th that's a whole other discussion. But I think I think this st you can start the sex conversation and really the masturbation conversation with teenage boys pre puberty. So you know somewhere around you know ev everyone goes through puberty at different ages. But because if your kids mature enough, man, as early as fifth grade. I mean, I really think that if if there is an open an open relationship um, and the kids know that they could talk and you're not going to judge them then they'll start to ask questions as soon as the questions start coming. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that's the goal. The goal is to create a place where I, I, I know that my father started to speak to me about this and gave me the message of, if you have any questions, this is also important. If you have any questions, come talk. Right. right? That, that's why I listen. I, tr I, I feel that you can handle this information and I'm sharing this with you. And if you have any questions, come to me and I'll, you know, let's, let's, let's have that conversation. Let's talk about it. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, be real with your kids, whatever, however you normally talk to your kids, you know, whatever language that you guys have as a family, you know, the cute language that we all have for, with our families, use, use, use that language because make it as real and as normal as possible. And some, the, the, the issue, the issue, which I, I've heard is that some parents just feel very uncomfortable talking about it. Right. If the parents and, are visibly awkward, then they're going to yeah. think it's shameful. Right. And, and, and it takes a taboo topic and makes it more taboo, which, right. is, I mean, which is a shame. So I, I think th those people should consult someone before they, you know, before they venture on. I go, I heard I got to talk to my kid. I'll make you go talk to my kid. Right. Even though I don't know how to say the word, ma, 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 you know, because they can't get the word out of their mouth. Um, I mean, when, when my kids have asked me <laughs> questions that I'm uncomfortable answering, um, I usually say, Oh, that's a really, really important question. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I'm just going to yeah. make sure to look into it so I give you the right answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that buys me a little bit of time, but... And then, and then you can rehearse the line you're going to say right. <laughs> until I finally can say it straight out. Right. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, so somebody wrote, I didn't understand the reference to Ruvain's conception. Yeah. So, so that that's where where it talks about um, the Torah makes it a point to mention that and really it's it's one of the commentaries that the first uh, drop of semen that came out of Jacob was when he conceived Reuven. So, if if the if the Torah finds it relevant to tell us that it, it's obviously um, you know if we if we really believe that nothing in the Torah is wasted. Um, so the, the, the Torah is telling us because how unique it was that, that the first drop of semen that Jacob spilled was in conceiving. That's not really so normal because most people do it way before. So that, that was that was that reference. I hope that was clear. So, so when the Torah points out the uniqueness of of the our four parents they're pointing it out because it's not the norm right it, it was so unique and so special and that that it felt it, it felt it necessary and also give us the lesson that this is this is pretty unique i mean right. we, we can all strive for that but the reality is the reality is that that's not reality <laughs> right uh, unless you're unless you're uh that special that's uh, right. So that I mean that, and that 
is how it ties into Yosef and um, very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And then, so somebody else asked if masturbation is forbidden for women as well in Judaism, but I'm not sure if we're going to get into like halachic stuff. Or I'm not a rabbi. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe we could get a rabbi to come in and talk about all of those. Like we did get a few questions like, like um, in advance about halachic stuff. And I, I, I specifically am going to def to like not bring those up because it's going to take us off topic and you probably don't mm -hmm. want to answer those. Uh, right. And you, but the funny thing is, actually, I, I did a group consultation today um, with with a bunch of peers, and that topic actually came up. Oh, really? Yeah. And, but, and, I'm not, but I'm not, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not a really, robot. I can't. I can't give. I, I can't comment on it. But um, but it's funny how that question was. Asked. It's not funny. I guess it's relevant. Right. Um, it is. And, and somebody else amount... also sent in a, another question about like. Uh, actually two people sent in about female masturbation um, and in different um, capacities. But I think I'm going to get um, somebody to address, like somebody that uh, on a different one, we're specifically addressing that topic. Right. Um, let's see what else. Uh, So, right, so I, 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 think, I don't really I think, understand one of the questions. Maybe you do. Why does family members disclude a child? Disclude a child, for example, the whole talk to everybody else and their language, but one person they want and will give them a silent treatment almost all the time. I really, if you could elaborate on, that, I'm not really sure if I understand I'm, that. Yeah. Do you understand that? What? Not really. Not so much. <sighs> Uh, I, I, just, I, I see. I see that Rachester is um, is you commented, but yeah. I, so I, I, I certainly not to compare us with with the with the Avos, um, but I think I think the human element that the, the the Torah is trying to bring out from from that that that's what I was referencing. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I somebody else said Rabbi Kaganoff from Pasea yeah. could be a good resource for halacha and addiction. Um, I hear, and then the that um some that person said I hear so many guys talking about the shame and fire and brimstone they receive in yeshiva and how they feel as a result. Right. So I'm 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 hoping, and I I just I, at least here in Chicago, I'm pretty aware of the fact that that type of language isn't used in talking to kids, and I hope that's the, the, the true in. Brooklyn, Lakewood, Muncie, Toronto, anywhere, California, anywhere. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I hope that we're not at that. Um, we're not at, um, that's still not being given over. But that, that certainly was the message when I was growing up and the rabbi that I spoke with earlier, you know, just to clarify some of the comments I made um, by quoting Torah, um, you know, he, what he shared with me. And I know a lot of my own peers, um, that I didn't go to school with, but they're just my age. You know, they, yeah, it was, we, we laugh about it now because we realize how not realistic, not, how, how not helpful it was. So. I know, I, I really feel, I feel like if, if there's anybody who's like run schools that's on here now, they should really reach out because Chicago does have amazing people talking about these topics with the boys. And I really feel like it makes, Right. a world of a like my kids are so grateful for that and and they're mm -hmm. they're able to to just like be normal about they're not silly about these topics they're just very normal and matter of fact and these are the challenges and it's just it's refreshing to hear how they talk about it um right. because there's they're just very realistic and and there's no shame about talking about it and there shouldn't be um even though i know that there are opinions in um the orthodox community that that we shouldn't be talking about it but i, I think that that's not the, so not anymore right so i so i want i want to share i want to share some crazy data with you right 
and hopefully this hopefully this can you know really convince people that we need to talk about it because you can't you can't really get around this so there's a certain website which I'm not going to mention because I don't want to market for them at all um, but they just put out their data for 2019 because we just hit 220 they put out their data it's a it's a pornography website and they put out their data of their kind of year in review and it will literally blow your mind okay so first of all this website in 2019 had 42 billion visitors on their website in 2019 right there was 1.36 million hours of new content uploaded on that website. It would take 169 years to watch all of that, just what was uploaded in 2019. Um, there was, and this uh, for, for the tech people who can understand what this means, over 18,000 terabytes of data uploaded or transfer onto the onto the website a day, and, and the, the, we, okay, two. Where, 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 where's that stat? I wanted to share. Over eleven thousand hours of video watched per minute on this website, and over eighty thousand visitors per minute. On this website it's mind-blowing so right this is a little bit off topic but can I ask you a question so all the yeshivas and and um, and you know girls schools that are promoting no smartphones and are making rules that there's no smartphones do you actually think that that helps or if they're gonna gain access they're gonna gain access so so there's no such thing as isolation anymore, right? The, the, in, in, in the sex addiction world with regard to pornography, they, they call the, the triple A's, anonymity, accessibility, and, afford, and affordability, right? You can't get around that. I think the people who actually play a, a heavier role, and if it's done strategically and warm and with genuineness and, and and open versus that authoritative, rigid um, family structure that we spoke about earlier. But but if it's done in a in a community communicative way, I I think it's the parents that actually need to play more of a role of what what type of access they give their kids with regard to smartphones stuff and, and, and all that stuff. And obviously there should be filters, restrictions, all that stuff. Where there's a will, there's a way. I've had people sitting on my couch over there, right, with a restricted smartphone, show me how they get around it within minutes, right? They can, so you can, you can have everything, but first of all, our kids are so much more savvy than us. Everybody will, will agree to that. Our kids are so much more savvy than us. So the question is, can we put on those restrictions and have our kids as our partners in keeping those restrictions, meaning this is for, you know, it's, it's like putting the, the net around the, the pool in the backyard for those who have pools in their backyard, right? We're putting there to keep us safe so no one falls in, right? So I'm not going to undo it because, you know, because I don't care if someone falls in, right? We, we all understand the, the necessary agreement that a pool around, a net around the pool is going to keep us all safe. So if that is part of the conversation that we have with the kids, we're putting restrictions on. Um, but it's not because we don't trust you. It's because it's crazy, you know? Right, because theoretically the kid could, could open up the net. In a second. Yeah, I'm telling you, I, I literally had people, more than just one person, with their restricted blocked phones that they can't do anything with, or so they think, unload, uh, you know, get around it within minutes. So it's, where, there, where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, one of my kids, apparently, that, like, the yeshiva, like, did some sort of filter action on their phone, and now they really have access to nothing. 
and they can't figure out how to get back to. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. But um, so so that there there might be some, but I just I I always wonder. Like, I always wonder whether it's helpful because I feel like restricting without giving tools is is kind of useless because the kids are it, it makes it just more fun for them to to act I, I, it becomes a cat and mouse game you know right. you know we just start policing and really what we want to teach our kids is how to you know how to go how how to go along with safety precautions that are out there and empower them yeah. with yeah why like why why do we not right um, yeah. Won't they run in search of what's being hidden? So, possibly. Right? There's, there, there's no. That's what that. I, I guess that's the point. That there's no. There's no. You know, one hundred percent foolproof way of doing it. If we can engage our kids in understanding why we're doing this and have them as our partners, like I said before, have it. Have them as our partners of what's going out there. And let's say, listen, boys are boys. And sometimes, you know, boys are disgusting boys, and they're going to want to look, and they're going to want to find. They're curious. They, and they're going to. They're, I mean, it, 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 that's what I'm saying. They're going to find these things, whether it's at your house or whether it's a friend's house, whether it's on your computer, whether it's on their friend's family's computer. They're going to find this stuff. The, the, that's just the reality. You can't. Mm -hmm. If if you if you're interested and all humans, boys and girls, are interested, right? They want to know what's going on. They want to see what the naked body looks like. They want to know what everything, you know, is, you know, they're curious, um, especially in a very sexualized world that we live in. So they're going to, you know, if we can, if we can get them to understand and partner with us, and if we can minimize, you know, what it is, or if they go and find it, they... Don't feel like, oh, my God, if I tell my parents what I saw, I'm dead. I'll be grounded for a month, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a week, but not a month, you know. So, you know, that, that's what that's what we got to, you know, that, that's the goal. Um, so Devorah is funny she, what she said, because I, I actually found the opposite. Um, they have to go hand in hand, but I feel like it's removing that chocolate bar from your home. So it's not easily at hand. So I used to do that until I learned about, like, intuitive eating and and so I used to kind of like throw everything out and 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 like restrict 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 like really really like try to like abstinence from anything that has like that could be harmful and what I found was if I keep a bag of M&Ms in my in my drawer in my in my desk and it's right there and I can have if I want it just takes, it like really takes all the fun out of it because right. I know I, like I play mind games with myself, but it, like I, I could, that same bag of M&M sits in my desk for like a month. Not me. I would down that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> because I know I can have, if I want to have the M&M, so I'll have a little bit of M&M. Right. Like it takes all the like that binge right. desire right. away right. when you Right. And I think, listen, I think at the end of the day, healthy living is living with everything in moderation. Now, you may have some genetic predispositions or other other pieces that kind of play a role in, you know, needing to be, um, you know, abstinent from certain things. And like, you know, we talk about, we can't be absent from food and sex. Um, so, you know, we, we, we try our best, but the, 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 the ideal life is living in moderation. And some people can do it and drug and alcohol addicts and sex addicts and food addicts, there, there, there is no such thing as moderation. Right. And that's, yeah. Um, so I, I think I've said this before in a live, but I think it's really, it's, it's important. It's a good story to, to add, um, to this. When my when one of my kids was was in I think eighth grade, um, you might have heard me tell the story before. So my kids go to a co-ed school um, until until high school, um, and so one of the teachers um, 
bought the seven habits of highly effective teens and didn't realize that there was a chapter of uh, about sex at the end of it and so she bought she's 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 um an orthodox woman um and uh, like a general studies teacher and she brought it to the class and when she gave it out the kids were all like laughing and being silly about it and she's like you know if you guys are going to be silly about it I'm probably just going to take it away and so my son went up to her at the end of class and said um you know if you don't teach this class about sex in in a kadusha in a kadushadic way they'll never have the opportunity to learn about it that way. Right. And I know that it's uncomfortable, but I really think that it's an important topic because a lot of these kids will go to high school and they'll never have the opportunity to learn from somebody who could teach them in a holy way. Right. <laughs> I, I, I definitely think that, you know, talking, talking about this topic, Obviously, you want to have. I, I'm 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 a I'm a proponent of, you know, having the parents do it. And if the parents can't do it for whatever reason, it should be done with a very warm and comfortable figure in the person's life, um, in some sort of consultation or con you know connection with the parents. But um, I, I you know I think I think that I. I, I don't think we can afford not talk about this with our kids. And I think someone, someone made, someone, someone made a comment before about like most of the stuff, I forgot where it was. I don't know how to go back. I'm not going to try to touch it. Someone made a comment before about, you know, um, working with uh, the women and guard your eyes. So first of all, Thank you for your work there, because that's fantastic. Oh, you know what? I work. have it right here. I'm going to read it out so that you can comment on it so people can sure. hear what, what the question is. I work with the women of Guard Your Eyes, and most all spouses, husbands, start acting out early in life. If I took right. a poll, it most, most parents were negligent or abusive. And for kids who are struggling, not addicted, it's on parents to guide and protect children and, more importantly, have a relationship with their kids and help them feel safe to share struggles. Yes. So, um, so mo most problematic sexual behaviors start um, at a young age. Now, the question becomes, are they sex addicts at a young age? Or you could look at the, the kid I work with who was masturbating over 10 times a day. He, he's, he's likely, you know, developing an addiction. Now, you know, is he also a highly charged teenager? Very possible. But the behaviors certainly start at a young age, right? Um, and I think that's true with, with most um, addictions, that they start at a young age. And, and the families, like I said before, you know, families, um, statistically speaking, People who have sex addiction, statistically speaking, are coming from authoritative, rigid, disengaged, and um, where, where emotion is, is, is viewed as being weak. Um, so, um, so I think that, that that's something that is, is true across the board, is that you, when you have that type of um, family structure, right, and, and maybe even community structure, Right, you're 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 going to have that. If someone asks questions about if, if the statistics are like that with regard to communities. I I, I don't I don't know. Um, I can't. Oh, you talk about that. Is sex uh, is sex addiction more common in communities that are extremely restricted? Right. So I so I I, I don't know this the, the statistics for that offhand. ITAP has tons of data, and I, I'm actually. Um, I'm, I'm strongly considering doing um, doing a study with the data from the zip codes because they, they have the zip codes of where uh, there's a lot of highly orthodox families so to, to learn more about that. If we could find any information um, about that, but I don't know if there's information about community wide, but certainly there's information and data from families and, and um, uh, you know, I, I, I have here, um, 
on my notes here, um, 77% of sex addicts come from rigid family systems, 87% come from disengaged family systems, um, and 87% um, have has addiction in the family also. So let's not ignore the genetic so Was the first thing that you said rigid? Rigid family system. Oh, okay. So we're like authoritative parents, okay. you know, the real drill sergeant, you know, families, yeah. Um, so somebody else asked, when is one considered an addict or just recreational? Yeah, you, you could, that's my brother. You can ignore him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dove. <laughs> um, no, I think that's a good question. No, no. So, so that, I think that kind of comes into the, the whole discussion of the moral incongruence of like, the, right, it's usher. It's, it's forbidden. Um, if it happens, it happens. You know, some people, you know, We'll, we'll, we'll do it as part of their, you know, it, it's one of those things, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not to make a comparison, but to compare, you know, when, um, when to, yeah, unmanageability, that's, that's true. Well, he said right? he compared it to a smoker. My, my brother's an oncologist, like to him, that's usser. Like one cigarette is usser because you right. don't know what's going to, um, sure. how many, cigarettes does it take right. to bring out the cancer right like right <laughs> like so, so i had I had this great this 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 thing over here yeah it's just to, to get into that and, and again it's not this isn't this isn't um let's see if i can find it this isn't torah based so uh, yeah uh, you know and, and every everyone should really kind of consult with their their faith-based figures that you want but you know you know, the question about masturbation in general, I, I don't know, someone, someone wrote on manageability, right? So if you feel like you, you have no manageability with it, it's, you know, that's not good. If you're doing it to self-soothe, um, then that's, you know, that's not, that's not healthy. If you're doing it, and if you're doing it and you're diso disassociating while you're doing it, that's also not healthy. So, so tension makes a difference. Is that what you're saying? I, I think intention makes a difference. Um, you know, if somebody, if somebody, um, if so, someone said, um, you know, when someone wants to stop but can't, you know, that, that's certainly, that's certainly true. Um, but I, you know, I think you, you have to really look at it. You know, if someone want, doesn't want to ever man, this is kind of going back to the, the, the topic at large of moral incongruence. If somebody doesn't ever want to masturbate, but for some reason does, you know, that doesn't mean he's an addict because he didn't want to, but yeah, he did. It, it has to be, you know, kind of that term of repetition compulsion. It's got to be, you know, really. It's got to lead to unmanageability. It's got to lead to, to you know, really intense distress. That's not that's separate than from moral congruence. Um, but um, you know, like I said before, if there's uh, if there's a disassociative factor to it, then you know, then that needs to be treated. Would that be kind of uh, an indication that it's trauma based. But anyway, so th that could be trauma based. That that normally is a flag for that. Um, but it, it it could be just a way to uh, escape in the moment from the guilt and the shame that's associated with it. So, but yeah, um, but it definitely would be a flag for trauma. So talented painting asked if you're always giving into a child. Uh, that child will think they could do what they want and misbehave because the parent is giving the trail of the freeway and not helping the child grow, just hurting the child. That's why children act out because they're really hurting. Um, so parts of that I, 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 I would agree with. Um, I, I think that kids, children need to feel um, an element of structure and responsibility and while also feeling respected. So I think in kids need kids need to know what's okay, what's not okay. Right? And and they and the, the more consistent those messages are, the better off they'll the better off they'll be. Um, you know, at the same time if you know if one kid needs one thing and another kid needs a separate thing. You know, I think we have to, as parents, respect the fact that one kid may need something different than the other kid um, and try our best to communicate that and to share that as openly but respectfully to the other kid as, as we can. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know if, you know, other, you know, 
unless unless your kid is unless you're treating your kid like Veruca Salt from you know Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you know where they get everything that they want. Yeah, that's not that they should hear no at some point in their life. Um, but it, it you know it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're giving into everything. Right. Right. I, I guess like parents. I mean, that's that's part of I, I guess right. each child right each child has each their child own. Either, but, but I think in general children need a sense of structure they need to know what to expect they need to know what's going on if things are very open ended then it, it, that really can increase anxiety it can really increase a sense of I'm alone and I don't know what to do which is devastating um, but you know I, I, at the, at the same time you know if we feel our kid needs something we should be afraid to give it to them because we're giving in. Maybe it's it's like there's like a an element of I feel like in everything there's there needs to be an element of balance. So Word. So like a right. So like so I mean you can't be so rigid that you know your kids feel like you're not even listening to them, but you can't be so loose that your kids you're, are walking all over you. So like there needs to be some sort of it's a tightrope walk a little bit. That, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, for myself, for for everybody that's out there, you know, whether they're a mental health professional, a a a a, a rabbi who is consulting with tons of family, everybody needs their person that they can balance things because we need we, we don't know how crazy we are, right? And we we have to own the fact that we don't know how crazy we are, mm -hmm. and and really get guidance, you know, because we have blind spots that we can't see and we need to be able to um, um, know that we don't have all the answers, especially with our own kids. And that's probably a very good indicator. If you think that you don't have any blind spots, then you probably have lots of them. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> um, it's true. So somebody said addiction often comes with co-occurring behaviors like lying, manipulation, selfishness. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I mean, because the, the, the need, especially with with this, because it's so taboo and hidden that, and 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 the truth is, with drugs and alcohol, also, we we need to lie and manipulate to get what we want. So yeah, that, those are all elements of addiction. Yes. Um. Yeah, and if there's a chocolate bar and like in your closet. <laughs> I think one of the first things one of the first things alcoholics need to do when they enter recovery is have someone go into their house with them so they can show all this all the places that they hide their bottles right all their stash you know um all their stash spots <laughs> um and and then for the person to look in places that he would stash it because the guy's probably not being honest that's so funny yeah. um Oh, Adina asks a uh, question. Food, sex, as you said, can't be all or nothing as opposed to alcohol and drugs. So how does that differ treatment-wise with regard to addiction? That, 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 that's a great question. I, and I think that um, I um, we'll kind of look at it from a, it's called a, a three-circle worksheet. Um, and the you visualize three circles kind of making a target. So the inner circle, the inner circle are all the behaviors that are on your abstinent list. So these are the behaviors I'm not going to do, right? Um, so whether it's look at porn, hire a prostitute, um, you know, um, eat, eat brownies or cookies, you know, whatever's on in that inner circle, that's my abstinent list. And if I do those things, my recovery starts again. My sobriety date starts anew. Then the middle circle, which is outside of that inner circle, are all the things that we need to have boundaries with. The things that we need to be able to identify that, oh no, I'm slipping into, you know, wh whatever it may be. And I need, I, need a, I need to reach out to my sponsor. I need to reach out to my therapist. I need to, I'm, I'm slipping. Um, and that's not just with regard to, uh, you know, and that's commonly called slips. And, the, the, and it's not necessarily... Um, only, you know, sex, food, behavior related things. It could be, um, it could be other, you know, self image 
ideas, you know, that we kind of go in our head or we start to, um, you know, we, Maybe the first thing for people who struggle with food, they, they find themselves eating, you know, more vegetables than, than they know they should. Or they start eating, um, you know, too many potatoes, which is heavy in starch. And, you know, whatever, whatever it may be that those, those things are outside. Um, but that's a middle circle. The, 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 the things that you need to have boundaries with because it could lead to your inner circle's behaviors. Um, and then really promoting the outer circle uh, behaviors, which are all the things that we do to take care of ourselves, you know, um, being a healthy, open, um, um, satisfying relationship, going to the gym and working out, um, like the proactive uh, stuff, you know, all, all the things that we need to do to take care of ourselves. So that, so, that's, that's a that little bit of a treatment model when it comes to that type of addiction. Uh, when it comes to like, like the food and like things that you can't abstain from. I'm, I'm sorry that's the treatment model for for things that you can't uh, abstain from right or? right right so when it comes to, yeah so when it comes when it comes to when it comes to food and sex the the, the things that you can't really be abstinent from um so there is that abstinent list these are the behaviors these are the foods these are the things that i'm not gonna do and then outside of that are, uh, like uh, madina said before triggers Right. Yes. It's the things that will trigger me to possibly go in there. The good there uh, yeah. And then really work on building up the outer circle behaviors. And that's yeah. different from alcohol and drugs. Well, yeah. Well, alcohol. I mean, in, in theory, you can kind of use the same model with it, but you know that you can't drink. But if you're an alcoholic, when you drink, you're done. Like your your sobriety is over. So it's pretty straightforward. So, like, right. a, a, somebody who's addicted to alcohol could never just have one drink and then they're done. Right, right. There's no, right. There's, if, if someone's following a 12-step model of, um, of Alcoholics Anonymous, of, um, you know, of abstinence-based recovery, so, right, it, it's, there's, there's no drinking. There's no, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to drink, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to drink, but I'll smoke a little pop, right? So there is there's none of that. And once you start doing that, there's, you know, you got to get back into recovery. Interesting. Yeah. And, and that, and you said that's a different part of the brain. So that's why it works. Right. So, yeah. So the, yeah. They're, 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 well, it's, it's, it's that, that's not why the treatment model is different because you, you physically can't abstain from food. It's, it's not human. It's, it, it, it's part of the human function to to be involved in sexual relations um so that's why there's no abstinence it happens to be with with people who are sex addicts there is there is a concept of having 90 days of abstinence right so the first 90 days in recovery no sex at all hmm. yeah but with with alcoholism with drug addiction um, it, it's very abstinence-based. You just stay away from those items. Interesting. Yeah. Um, were there any other points that we that you had that we didn't no. cover? No, I, I, this this was fun. <laughs> <laughs> fun. I, we should do it again sometime. Definitely. Um, I, I thank I, you all for your questions and comments. Thank you. This it was so <laughs> informative. Especially my brother. Hmm? Especially my brother. Oh yeah, yeah. There was, there was one of my other brothers actually wrote something else in there. Oh, did, did we skip it? Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Oh, I want to see. Well, yeah, that's what happens when you put on your family chat. You doing this? They, they come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm the youngest. I'm the youngest in my family, so my older brothers are like making sure they give me a hard time. Uh, I don't think my brothers are interested in. <laughs> well, you should get to know my brothers. <laughs> um. I'm I'm trying to look back. I can't I can't find it. You made a comment about not going to the bathroom. The Torah doesn't talk about going to the bathroom. Some of that. Oh. I saw it. I saw. It. Um. Okay, so I think we we got m pretty much all the questions. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And um, if uh, if if anybody wants to send you questions, uh, yeah. You are you okay with that or 
I, I, I am okay with it. You certainly can send me my email address is yglcsw at gmail.com. Find me on Instagram. Um, I, I'm on LinkedIn. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm around. You can find me. And um, you're, and, and you're taking mm -hmm. new clients if uh, I in the Chicago area. I, I, anyone in the Chicago, I am taking uh, a few new, a few more clients. Um, thankfully, I'm, I mean, thankfully and not thankfully, I'm, I'm almost uh, full. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am available. I, I will say if anyone that reached out with questions, um, being that I don't know you specifically, I, I may not be able to give you the full answer, but if I could be a, a helpful um, in leading you to your full answer, then I'd like to help. And do you have any, you know, book, if anybody wants to learn more about this topic, uh, do you have any book recommendations or um, so, so there, there, there are no books about moral incongruence because it's, it's there, but um, Facing the Shadows is a book by Patrick Carnes, which um, talks about uh, sex addiction. It's, um, the, Patrick Carnes is the person who really established SAA, um, and he's the, he's the, I guess, the, I don't know, he's the, he started ITAP, the International Institute of Trauma Addiction Professionals. There really um, isn't a lot on moral incongruence. I was looking. It's at, nice. I could yeah. barely find um, academic articles. Yeah, no, if we, because it, it, it's more of an idea that, that just because you screw up in your religious beliefs doesn't make you a drug, uh, doesn't make you um, a sex addict. You know, it's, right. it's, it's a concept, but I think we miss that. Certainly in, like, and I, I, love, I love the way you phrased it, the faith-based communities. Um, especially with the, 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 the you know, and again, it, it, it's really, it's really done so we can be healthy um, people. It, it, it really is so we can, you know, feel a connection to a power greater than ourselves. Um, but just because you're human and you're going to mess up in life doesn't mean that you are a sex addict. We tend to take things to the extreme. Yeah, we're, we're pretty extreme people. Like, I find that, and I don't think it's unique. I think I think it's all faith-based communities because I, I'm noticing when I'm doing research on certain topics, I'm yeah. noticing that it's really not just us. I, I think it's anybody. Yeah, I tell you, when when I when I was doing the training, the CSAT training, um, when I was doing my CSAT training, the Certified Sex Addiction um, Therapy Therapist, whatever. Um, and, and this topic of moral incongruence came up as a, as a differential diagnosis for sex addiction. It, it, it was, you know, and I was only, I was only from Jew in the, the crowd of about 60 other mental health professionals. And um, it was, it was really amazing to see how, how common this idea is. It's not just a, it's not a Orthodox Jewish thing. It's a, mm. it's a, it's a, it's a really a religious thing. A faith-based thing, which again, I, 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 I I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Look, I got, I'm a big fan of, re of religion. I, you know, I actually I, I, think we our Torah, like the way that we practice, is actually a little bit lighter. Like we don't idealize abstinence in other faith-based communities. Yes. They do. Right. You know, like, that, that's so true. So I mean, it we're I think that 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 the way that we learn is pretty realistic in general. Right. There, I mean, right. There is a time, like you said, there's 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 a time to to get drunk, you know, in in Torah, right? Right. Um, there there's there there's a time to get drunk. There's a time to, you know, there 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 are times to have sex. There there are times where it's a mitzvah, right, to have sex, right? There there are times where um, we're supposed to eat, you know, meat and wine, you know, like like, mm -hmm. like we're supposed we're supposed to do these things and there are times um, to fast <laughs> and there are times to fast and there are times to be somber and there are times to you know to you know, we, we spend a month on inner reflection of you know how can i improve myself this month what are the things that i did this year that were not in my best interest and i gotta you know i gotta you know not take on resolutions but i gotta take on um, i gotta be honest with myself and look at myself and say how, how am i doing this you know how, am i being the best me as i can um, and, 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 you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, you know, all faith-based 
communities are like that. And um, uh, yeah, that's. Um, Leia said a lot of it is learned as a child. You mess up and you're worthless. Unfortunately, now that, that's what we talked about before about the, the, the rigid family structure. Like, you know, follow my direction. I'm the drill sergeant, you are the cadet. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's, it's true. And I think we, you know, as parents and it's certainly as the, as edu you know, for people in education, like be, be real. Like I, there was a clip of uh, Rabbi Moshe Weinberger, you know, basically screaming about um, how, you know, principals throwing kids out for, you know, for these type of behaviors. And he said, what, what were you doing when you were that age? Right. You can tell me that you weren't, you know, what he called Pogo my bris. You weren't, you weren't, you didn't masturbate when you were that age. And, um, well, listen, we're, 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 we're not angels. We need to work on ourselves and we need to refine and let that define who we are and not, not just let our behaviors define who we are. I think that's a really great place to leave off. Yeah. Again, this was a lot of fun. Empowering. Thank you so, so much. And, uh, um, I'm going to have to rewatch it to like take notes and <laughs> I'm going to have to rewatch it to see what I want to think back. I'm saying, not kidding. <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone All for right. coming. And, uh, hopefully this will save. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, we'll be in touch. Have a good night, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks.